Today we are taking a closer look at SDV. So, what is an SDV? A new kind of crime drama. No, not quite. A new chain of pharmacies. Nope, not that either. No, we're talking about software-defined vehicles today. In the world of automotive design, software reigns supreme, with 100 million lines of code being the baseline for new vehicles today. But how do we, in all of those lines and lines of code, keep stringent functional safety and security front and center? Software reuse. That's how. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. With the sheer amount of automotive software cost and complexity today, we need a way to maximize software reuse across our process platforms. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Daniel Bassler and I take a closer look at the software ecosystem for NXP's S32K3 MCU. We investigate how real-time drivers, a comprehensive safety software platform, and high-performance security system will help you tackle the cost and complexity of automotive software development. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from NXP. Hi, Danny. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi there, Amelia. It's good to be here. Thanks. Okay, so we're talking about tackling the cost and complexity of automotive software today. But Danny, before we get started, can you set the stage for us? We're talking about a lot of lines of code, right? Yeah, I mean, it's well known that electronic content in vehicles has been steadily increasing over time, um, driven by demand for primarily more features. Features means ECUs, and that in turn means software. Um, and the numbers are, are kind of fairly uh, well circulated, but the latest figures suggest somewhere in the region of in excess of 100 million lines of code in premium high-end vehicles today. So it's quite a significant undertaking to manage, of course, and not only the software in the vehicles as well, but the accounts for an increasing percentage of vehicle recalls and warranty related costs and relating to the upgrading of these systems over time, you know, after they're initially put into the field. So it is certainly significant. And there's a few elements that are kind of driving it forward, present in particular, two of the kind of foundational things that have existed for several years, but are now increasing in scope are safety, or more specifically, functional safety, as it's referred to, which essentially is compliance with automotive safety integrity levels or ASIL levels, where Um, A system will be required to have a certain level of safety protection, historically powertrain, braking and other vehicle dynamics type applications, but that's spread through a much larger number of applications in the vehicle and that in turn has and necessitates software growth as well. Um, and not just combustion engine vehicles, very much in new and electrification platforms as well, battery management systems, all of that kind of emerging application space, there's a strong requirement for safety there. And security, uh, very much following in the footsteps of that. Um, lots of headlines in recent years about cars being subject to hacking and things like that, uh, but just generally anything that's connected now in the vehicle, there is an increasing requirement to secure that ECU, both internally and when it's communicating with other ECUs around the car or indeed externally. So these things are kind of coming on top of what is just a large high growth of ECU content. And you add into that the kind of new trends of autonomous driving or even assisted driving, which is largely the focus today. Um, Electrification in many areas, battery management systems, motor control, advanced algorithms to increase vehicle range, over-the-air connectivity into cars, kind of networking processor type features, and being able to remotely upgrade the firmware of ECUs, addressing these recall type issues that are typically caused today. And generally on top of that, just a more immersive experience, kind of personalization of features in the car, Um, new aesthetics, lighting, audio, infotainment, all of that is driving a huge surge in software content within vehicles, even and not just at high end, but across the various tiers of vehicle platform today. That makes sense. Now, Danny, when it comes to automotive software, what are we really looking at when it comes to this new S32K3 family? 
So S32K3 is the latest of our automotive MCU families just launched in November 2021. It brings some elements that we've had before, but it builds on them in many areas. Um, we provide a variety of software uh, with all of our auto processors and have done historically. But we've kind of upgraded and added to that with this latest product range. It comes in various tiers for different reasons. Um, uh, first and foremost uh, are the kind of drivers, the low-level drivers that are required to interface to the MCU. And these are required for one of two different environments. Many customers in automotive will be required to implement what we call AutoSAR, the Automotive Open System Architecture, within their design mandated by the CAR OEM. So that has some particular requirements in terms of the software drivers for the MCU and the additional software layers above them. Other customers may not require that, so non-AutoSAR type applications, but again, there is a requirement for having drivers. And so we've had these historically, but there has been some limitations around the way that they are delivered, both technically and commercially. And some of that is just as a result of the AutoSAR architecture. So we've got a new package there that addresses that. On top of that, we then turned our attention to safety. Um, it's, there's safety hardware, of course, within the processor that provides the mechanisms for the monitors and the checking functions. And then customers are typically having to execute safety software to run the checks, do the monitoring, and then report that back to some other part of the application. So we provide safety software software there, kind of traditional stuff, uh, but now a complete new package, so a whole new framework of software on top of that as well. There's software requirements there that are firmware requirements that's executed by the hardware accelerator to execute the security algorithms, um, as well as the software driver to run on that, to interface with that peripheral. And then you can have OTA software as well, of course, the management of the over-the-air updates and the configuration and loading and management of the code into the different areas of memory. We're also, with the S32K3 family, introducing multi-core MCUs. So these are MCUs that where they have more than one core um, with optional what we call lockstep support for advanced safety. So multi-core generally has great potential in terms of processing power and safety and, and other areas. Um, it presents some challenges when it comes to communication between cores, either on the same MCU or between MCUs, and in particular where you're using shared communication media, the same kind of data bus or, or communication path, whether it's CAN or Ethernet or something like that. So accessing it over these same media at the same time in the same areas of memory, same resources can create conflict. So we've provided or delivered a new multi-core management software package to help customers manage that efficiently. And then finally, on top of that is application-specific software that might be for motor control applications, algorithms, motor tuning tools, debugging tools, as well as LED lighting, a high growth area in vehicle, in car, cabin and external. So there's a really growing range of software that is required beyond the kind of basic demo stuff that you run on the chip. Various new flavours, some of it mandatory, some of it very much optional as well, but all of it is starting to move right into the kind of edge node processors within the vehicle. These kind of general purpose MCUs are being required to run a lot more software than they were historically. It's not just confined to the very high-end processors within the vehicle. Okay, great. Now, Danny, what do you see are the biggest challenges in terms of real-time software? The key focus for that is AutoSAR or non-AutoSAR. And what we have today is customers will be developing it in one of two areas, either AutoSAR in their application or not. And so that, by definition, means they have to have typically two different sets of drivers. They need to maintain two separate software architectures and tool sets. So there is development cost, development effort, maintenance effort implications there. And there's also some issues with regards to error management. It's difficult with both those packages as well. The developer typically needs detailed knowledge of the hardware IP. So there are some limitations generally across both those kind of avenues of development. Um, looking into each one in turn with an AutoSAR, typically the drivers don't support all of the on -chip, of the processor's on-chip IP peripherals because they are limited or defined by the AutoSAR standard. So they are set in stone and you can't go beyond that. 
And also a license cost is usually required as well for the MCAL microcontroller abstraction layer drivers. So there's technical as well as some commercial issues which can be prohibitive in certain designs in particular if a customer is new to AutoSAR or indeed there are commercial pressures where it's not something that is stopping them from getting into an OEM design a bidding process because of not having that support. Um, on the flip side, if it's a non-AutoSAR system Typically, customers would use packages like an SDK, an NXP, a software development kit, which are fine to all intents and purposes, but they are typically not safety compliant. So that the processor itself, in this case, the S32K3 MCU and all other NXP auto processors are developed using what we call functional safety compliant process. And ISO 26262 is the industry standard, which means the processor has been developed to meet a certain assumed safety case level and the definition, design, manufacture, qualification and support of that processor is compliant with that standard. That doesn't always exist with software. It does with AutoSAR software, but with non-AutoSAR software like an SDK, it's not safety compliant. It's not being developed using that type of process. So um, that can present certain challenges when it comes to customers who need safety compliant software, but in a non-AutoSAR environment. So that's one issue. There's also some limitations around multi-core support of SDKs, being able to support those different multi-core and configurations. And finally, within the MCU itself, we have something called privileged or user mode, which is essentially a protection mechanism for the registers that prevents any unauthorized hardware or software changes occurring during read, write or clear operations on those specific register contents. So that's something that historically we've not had in our SDK. So these limitations exist today. Um, the new real-time drivers package that we've developed with the S32K3 has been designed to address these uh, with a single set of software drivers that kind of unifies both application areas together, AutoSAR and non-AutoSAR. So, Danny, can we talk a bit more in depth about those real-time drivers you mentioned? Uh, sure, Amelia. Um, so, first of all, it supports not only the new S32K3 MCU family, but also its sibling, the S32K1 family that's in production today. And it will support future real-time core-based MCU and MPU families from NXP, including the new S32G processor as well. The existing drivers have been enhanced, they're extended, and we've also added new drivers as well, what we refer to as complex device drivers. So, the benefit for AutoSAR customers is that these drivers are not limited by the AutoSAR standard. They cover all of the processor's IP, all of the peripherals, and also we're removing the production license cost. The drivers are free of charge for AutoSAR use, um, as they are for non-AutoSAR as well. And for non-AutoSAR customers, the drivers are safety compliant. They have been developed using an ISO 26262 compliant development process. And finally, the drivers can also, previously only accessible for AutoSAR applications, can now be used in non-AutoSAR applications. So it's a much more flexible solution overall, giving customers one set of drivers that they can use in both environments without limitation. And the drivers themselves are what we call production qualified. So they comply with what's called SPICE uh, Level 3 and they are MISRA 2012 tested. So automotive quality levels in terms of coding standard and available within that. Um, so the real-time drivers overview on the block diagram here, the way it works is that each software driver will expose two interfaces, a high-level interface, which is driven by the AutoSAR standard, and the APIs are defined by that standard, and that can also be used in non-AutoSAR applications as well. Um, and a low-level interface for non-AutoSAR use only. Um, another key point to mention here is that we have integrated the drivers within our S32 Design Studio IDE. Previously, if you were using the drivers in an AutoSAR environment, the NXP MCAL, you would have had to have used a partner tool to configure them from Electrobit Tracer Studio, to name one. Um, you can still do that, but now you have the option as well to use NXP's own in-house S32 Design Studio platform. And within that is a tool called S32 Config Tool that allows you to configure the drivers for both AutoSAR and non-AutoSAR use. So just giving flexibility to customers on how they 
you can configure them, but maintaining configurability using AutoSAR partner tools from Electrobit, Vector and others. Um, customers get the documented source code, they get the examples, they get the demos, the drag and drop functionality. So it has a very similar look and feel to the SDK that we have introduced uh, with the S32K1 family before it. And it uses the same API application programming interface as the previous MCAL. So it'll have a similar look and feel for AutoSAR customers. And finally, it's supported by the GCC compiler, the new compiler that we use in our own S32 Design Studio IDE as well as compilers from third parties, IAR and Greenhills. Okay, so Danny, what does using real-time drivers really buy me as an engineer? So here you can see just a summary of the benefits of RTD for both environments, our project needs AutoSAR, non-AutoSAR, and then commercially, IP coverage, safety compliance, production or software quality, additional middleware, error handling, development support, in particular for configuration. That's the totality of what you get with RTD. So flexibility, broad IP coverage, safety compliance for both environments, additional drivers for analog error handling, and then the ability to configure using traditional partner tools or indeed NXP's S32 Design Studio ID as well. So we're addressing the uh, technical as well as the commercial limitations or challenges around the solutions that exist today to try and really open up AutoSAR uh, more broadly to customers who want to use the S32 K3 family. And indeed, uh, it's not limited to the K3 family. It also now supports the K1, as well as the S32 G2 networking processor. And it will do the same for future real-time core-based processors that are coming as well. So it's a new solution for driver support, a new platform for that going forward. So another important aspect of any automotive design is also safety, right? What does the S32K family bring to the table in terms of safety? Um, so there's quite a lot to offer. We've had traditionally some software and we've built upon that and I'll kind of go through that now. Um, so with the S32K3, if you like the range or the safety capability with the S32K1 family, that's a, a single core MCU family that support what we refer to as up to ASO level B applications with the K3. We're moving into multi-core, but with single core options as well. And critically introducing a feature called Lockstep essentially has broad usage in safety, but can be also used in other general higher performance applications. So with that, we move up to higher safety level and in turn need to kind of extend our software packages to support that. So the safety hardware ranges from various uh, lockstep cores, ECC flash and RAM memories, multiple watchdogs, power and clock monitors, all of these hardware IP mechanisms need to have a kind of software layer above them uh, so that the developer can interface to them and extract the appropriate data from them and then use that within the system to take the appropriate action. So first of all, SPD, safety peripheral drivers, are a set of low-level drivers specifically focused on safety, as the name suggests. And these ones are for the BIST built-in self-test manager, which configures, initiates, and provides access to the BIST functions within the device. And there's also one for what's called extended MCU error manager. So it configures what's called the fault collection and control unit, the error reporting module, and provides handlers to faults sig to this FCCU. So that FCCU monitors all of the safety mechanisms, and then they all feed into it, and it then assesses what the faults are and determines what appropriate reaction to take, trigger an alarm or an interrupt or reset the system. So these drivers are kind of focused on those hardware elements. And these safety peripheral drivers are for customers who want to develop their own safety framework, but who need some drivers to really kind of get going, get started, to understand how to use the safety hardware on the processor. And the drivers use the same architecture as the real-time drivers I just spoke about. So they will work alongside the RTD drivers and they also support AutoSAR and non-AutoSAR environment use as well. So that's kind of part one. Part two is what we call core self-test or SCST. We've had this for some time with our single core MCUs and we've applied it now or extended it to the K3 family. So with the K3, we're looking at multi-core as well here. So 
um, but, but with single core options. So core self-test is a safety measure for detecting permanent, latent or single point hardware faults in the core specifically um, with up to a 90% diagnostic coverage. So for non-lockstep MCUs, this would typically be software that's utilised and it can be executed during startup and shutdown or periodically during runtime as well. So we have that um, available as kind of the second one, again, supporting the ARM Cortex M7 course on the K3 processor. And then finally, we have a new product called Safety Framework Software. Basically, this is kind of like the superset of the safety peripheral drivers. So what this is, it's a package of libraries and drivers within that that provides fault detection and reaction components to detect the fault and to take the appropriate reaction to it. And it covers all of the software safety mechanisms in the microcontroller as documented in the safety manual. So within the safety manual for the processor, there's a group of safety mechanisms called SM2. And this safety software framework covers all of that. So it's a much more broader kind of umbrella like safety cover across all of the hardware safety mechanisms on the device. The benefits of this is that by covering all of the assumptions in the safety manual, you can use it up to A and up to ASO level D applications. So you get the higher level of safety coverage in software. And critically, a safety software is typically difficult to write. You need a, an intimate understanding of the IP, uh, the peripherals, um, the cores, and all the system IP that connects them together. So by providing this software from NXP, we're taking away a lot of the effort that customers would otherwise have to expend themselves to understand and then map this out, going through the safety manual for many hours. So uh, we're saving effort and we cover everything on the chip. The safety software framework, like the safety peripheral drivers and the real-time drivers and processor itself, follows or is developed using an ISO 26262 compliant development process. So everything is, if you like, underpinned or has that foundation of ISO 26262 compliance. So Danny, that was for safety, but what about security? What requirements exist today in vehicles for secure systems? Okay, so security is a newer requirement, but it's following a similar path, it would appear. It seems to be accelerating in terms of the introduction of standards, which customers are now having to consider in their designs. So there are some historical specifications and guidance in the form of the SHE specification, which kind of lay the foundation of automotive security in electronic systems. And then that was then added to by the Avita guidance, which kind of introduced the concept of a programmable subsystem when the three different versions, full, medium and light. Um, and what we've seen typically are OEMs and customers generally are using elements of those combined with their own specifications, a kind of hybrid, if you will, with regional considerations as well, whether it's in Europe, Americas, or indeed in Asia. Um, more recently, there has been a new regulation that's come into force, R155, and on the back of that, a new ISO or ISO SAE standard, ISO 21434, which essentially requires automotive cyber security for new vehicle types that are launching in Europe, Japan, and Korea from July 2022 and onwards. Um, so the, this new standard is deemed to be very appropriate in implementing the requirements of cyber security management systems as specified by the regulation um, in terms of in organisations. So it's similar in essence then to the ISO 26262 standard that exists for safety today in that as NXP, as a supplier, we have our role is to demonstrate our compliance with that standard in terms of how we develop our processors. So we, they are developed using an ISO 21434 compliance standard and therefore are intended for use in a cyber security applications. So that's implemented, of course, by hardware security features and software security layered on top of that as well. So NXP has recently achieved certification as being compliant with the new standard and certified by the Tooth Suit organization here in Europe. So um, we are well on the way to achieving compliance with the standard within the automotive industry. Okay, so Danny, how does this S32K3 address the market requirement for security in terms of hardware and software? Okay, um, well, a little bit of context. So NXP has been active in security as it has safety 
for many years now on the non-automotive space, um, leadership in financial transaction type technologies, e-passport, mobile payment, things like that. So we've borrowed the IP and the latest expertise to implement that within the automotive processing business line and K3 benefits from that. So uh, we've been implementing she level, she being the secure hardware extension the former guidance that was mentioned in the previous slide, on our processor since 2010. So that has evolved over time. And all of our automotive processors and microcontrollers since 2017 have included on-chip cryptographic hardware accelerators. The latest version that we are using is what we refer to as the HSE hardware security engine, specifically HSEB, and that's what's on the S32K3. So this is a complete high performance security subsystem that we have developed in conjunction with the car OEMs globally to address the current and future forward looking requirements of vehicle systems. And the security subsystem itself is effectively composed of three elements. There's the hardware accelerator, which effectively executes the firmware and security algorithms. There's the firmware itself, and then there's the dedicated secure memory within the processor that's allocated to the storage of the security keys. You could add to that, of course, the security driver or the driver for the security peripheral, the HSEB as well. So it's effectively a one-stop shop, uh, to use the term, all from NXP. Uh, and what the HSE does is it runs the relevant security functions for applications that have confidentiality or authentication, authenticity requirements. So the main purpose is to isolate security center information, i.e. secret keys from the application or host, to offload the application from processing cryptographic operations, the dedicated hardware accelerator embedded within the HSE peripheral removes the load from the main application core. So those are free to focus on doing whatever application processing is required. And the HSE can do both symmetric uh, as well as asymmetric, which is quite computationally intensive algorithm processing. So it's ideal having that done out with the main cores, and that's why we implement it in the hardware. And it also enforces the security measures in the application during both runtime as well as system startup. And we've developed this IP in anticipation of the new standard, the ISO 21434, which was published just back in August 2021. Okay, so Danny, what in particular sets NXP apart from the rest of the pack when it comes to security? Well, it's really the all-in-one nature of what we offer. Um, the HSE subsystem, again, is comprehensive. It's tailored for performance and also future-proof in terms of evolving, uh, moving to asymmetric algorithms, more computationally intensive, more key storage, more parts of the network requiring security. The firmware, the next element, we provide that as an encrypted binary file through the NXP website. The driver for the HSC peripheral as well is included in the real-time driver. So we give all of that in one complete package. It's all free. There's no hidden cost to any of that. There's no price adder on the silicon for the HSE module. There's no external partner to go to for the firmware. That comes from NXP. And the driver as well is provided free of charge for both Autosar and non-Autosar. So again, just trying to remove any technical or commercial barriers or limitations around the use of the silicon via the software. Customers essentially will need to do the integration and application development, of course, and that's kind of indicated in the diagrams there in the upper half, the ECU functions and features that they want to implement, and then the high-level security stack that would sit on top of the driver, whether it's Autosar or non-Autosar. Uh, TLS, uh, for example. So that's the complete package. We also, uh, just as a, a means of assurance, NXP has what's called a Product Security Incident Response Team, PSIRT, which is a global support team on 24-7 standby who provides support for customers who experience any security incidents in any NXP products, hardware or software. So should there ever occur, that team would quickly assess what the customer's reported security vulnerability and would provide clear guidance on the solution to address it, on the impact, the severity and the mitigation required to prevent it from reoccurring. So that is the kind of backup 
that exists beyond the IP and the hardware and the firmware and the driver is that kind of layer of technical support and assurance, very much similar to what we have in our functional safety. So there is a kind of a mirror image, if you like, of where safety has come from and is now, security is now arriving. So, so Danny, what do we mean by inner platform communication and what are the challenges with this today? So the name is a bit of a mouthful. Um, NXP is very keen on its acronyms and IPCF is another new one here. To try and keep it light, um, a typical automotive multi-core system, you'll have either multiple homogeneous cores or heterogeneous cores running on a single chip or across multiple chips in an ECU. Now, they will typically be running multiple operating systems. It might be Autosar, it might be Linux, it might be FreeRTOS or some other. And they're using multiple transportation interfaces to exchange data, shared memory, Ethernet, PCI Express, etc. Challenges that can result with our cores need to collaborate, but they need to be isolated as well. You can't have conflict. Uh, they need to be able to access those resources without conflict. Or they can't bottleneck when they're trying to access the same media at the same point in time. And it needs to be low latency, i.e. no delay and high bandwidth. There's a lot of traffic now getting pushed around these networks. Um, safety, security, or other general software, especially where lots of data is moving, that is a critical requirement not to keep the pipeline open, if you will, you know, don't restrict it in any way. So how is that managed today? Typically, developers will implement or have their own proprietary solutions, a multi-core operations library or an equivalent software provided by third parties, uh, like a reference or production implementation of MC API, multi-core API over some ACUs. So there's some challenges for sure. Um, what IPCF is, it's multi-core management software that provides point-to-point -point communication between those cores in such systems. So its most common use case would be, for example, between a Cortex-A core on a processor running Linux and a Cortex-M core running Autosar or a different OS. But it can be used on a processor with similar cores like the K3, which is Cortex-M7 cores. So you have two cores, uh, for example, in different environments, one running bare metal code and the other running Autosar, or you have one locks type island and one individual core. Um, so it's mostly intended to be used and beneficial for K3 families that have dual cores to separate decouple cores or triple core or a version of that. Not so much for a single core MCU or indeed for a lockstep core device. And it's designed for closely distributed embedded systems with very low latency and very small footprint in terms of the size of the IPCF software itself. Uh, developers can choose to build exactly what they want in terms of hardware, operating systems, and transport layer support. And each operating system vendor has their own equivalent to IPCF developed by NXP and therefore is tuned and optimized for our processors, of course. So Danny, circling back to the software ecosystem you mentioned earlier, what does the full package look like for the S32 K3 MCU family? So there's a lot of it is the kind of key message I guess I want to convey in this um, software block diagram. A few additional ones to mention. MBDT, Model Based Design Toolbox, that is a plugin for the MATLAB Simulink environment. And we've had this now for some time and it now supports the K3 processor. And it allows developers who are doing model based design to model their design on the K3 processor and saving significant development effort and time for applications like motor control. You don't have to build the system um, in hardware, uh, tune the motor, everything can be modeled. And then once that's optimized, then move that over into the S32 design studio ID to do debug and then finally on to silicon and a motor to actually tune the live system. So that's kind of one example. Uh, we also have a new power estimation tool for S32K that allows developers to get an initial power current consumption estimation based on their specific use case by setting specific levers within that. So again, to understand what will be the likely power consumption profile in the application using the K3 or S32K1 processor. Um, motor control tools, we have a broad range of those. Motor control libraries that are highly optimized. Um, tuning tools, debugging tools, very powerful motor control enablement software there. And finally, software packages, software drivers for applications like ESLED protocol support for LED lighting and battery management software as well. So it's a broad range 
changing and multi-element package of software and tools that wraps around the processor. So Danny, are there different options for this software package? We've segmented or partitioned the software into three categories, premium, standard and reference. The main differences between those are premium software is from NXP, it's production grade, so automotive spice level and in some cases ISO 262 compliant and that would be purchased the commercial model, there would be a special MCU part number, a character in the part number or a one-time license purchase. Um, and examples of that are the premium security firmware, so that's the OEM specific version, the safety software framework and core self-test software um, and motor control libraries, for example. The next one is the standard software that comes with the silicon and the new real-time drivers, the safety peripheral drivers, the inter-platform communication framework, uh, and the LIN stack as well. And then finally, reference software, which as the name suggests, is for reference use. Again, this comes from NXP, but also may be provided by some of our partners. Free to use where and when required. It might be TCP IP stacks, free RTOS operating system, or other general software most of them being free of charge, only some of them requiring a license cost. So really kind of opening up access to new applications, new technologies, not just through the hardware IP, but with, through the software packages that are now provided with it. So Danny, what are the main differences between this new S32K3 family and its sibling, the S32K1 family? They range from higher frequencies and uh, multi-core options with lockstep. The memory is stretched to 8 megabytes with ECC enabled for flash and for safety. The security I've spoken about before, you know, extending the algorithm supports into asymmetric, more key storage, OTA um, over the air updates, a full hardware implementation there with read well write memories, memory remapping for AB swap with firmware address translation and firmware rollback option as well. Safety, of course, follows from that. And we've also extended the capabilities of other peripherals connectivity with uh, optional gigabits Ethernet control with time-sensitive networking protocol support, multiple CAN controllers for CAN FD support, advanced timers for motor control or other general purpose functions, and the very latest peripherals for communication. And we've retained the flexible input-output peripheral that we had on the K1 today, but also extended the range of that to emulate some additional communication protocols, in particular uh, sensor uh, interface related protocol. And, and finally, in terms of packaging all this, it's in BGA and LQFP packages, but we've also introduced a new Max QFP package option, which is unique to NXP in the K3 family, is the first one to use it. And it combines the classic Gullwin QFP package with a PLCC package uh, where the J-lead pins are interleaved between the LQFP pins, so giving a much higher pin count density for the same footprint area for conscious design. So. Okay, and here we can see the S32K3 family overview, how all of that hardware, IP, peripherals and cores are implemented, are mapped across the portfolio. So you have a set of common features down the kind of middle left column there, full AEC Q100 qualification up to 125 degrees C ambient temperature, 3 to 5 voltage domains, either 3 volt, 5 volt, or we can have both. Security over the air, low power, another big area of investment here. So uh, run mode and standby mode, simplified low power architecture, but with very good fast wake up from stop, fast processing and return to sleep modes. Um, and then the other safety, timing and debug support. And then around that, we simply build or scale the family. So as you move from the left to the right, you move from the single core to the dual core, lockstep plus type core families, if you will, going from far left to far right. And the flash memory sizes just kind of repeat across the range from one megabyte to four megabyte and then up to eight megabyte at the very far right hand side. So, Danny, do you have any evaluation kits if my audience wants to get started with the S32 K3? Yes, we do, and they're available today on the NXP website. There are two evaluation boards. Um, both feature the 4 megabyte flash family member, the S32 K3 44, which is the lockstep configured MCU. The Q257 board has the 
MCU in 257 map BGA package. And conversely, the Q172 board on the middle column there has the same MCU, but in the 172 max QFP package. So that's the main difference between them. The, the Q257 board, it's a bit larger and has some more functionality around it, so if required by developers. But essentially, they are both production suitable tools that can be used. Just to point out, you'll notice four part numbers on the slide there. The ND part numbers below there are temporary partner numbers that NXP has introduced. It just indicates a board or version of the same board that is not populated with NXP Kinetis K26 MCU. That's simply for temporary supply reasons. But what that MCU does is that provides what we call the onboard debug function. So if the customer receives one of the boards with the ND suffix or part number, then there is no Kinetis K26 MCU on the board, hence the ND or no debug part number nomenclature. And it would require the customer or developer to use an external debug probe from partners such as IAR or SEGAR or PE Micro's multi-link tool. So there are workarounds to it. And again, it's just a temporary inconvenience that we're just having to manage with regards to component supply. Not with the K3, incidentally, but with a salary component in the K26 MCU. So that's the boards and the software, the S32 Design Studio, the S32 Configuration Tool within that, which can be used for configuring clocks, pins, peripherals, DDR memory, and the real-time drivers for Autosar and non-Autosar. That all comes free of charge as well. Excellent. Well, Danny, this was a lot to take in today. Can you recap your main points for me? Yes, certainly. There's a lot of hardware IP, but we have boosted that, if you like, with the software package wrapped around the processor. Broad ranging, it covers all of the traditional as well as new application or requirements in terms of security and safety and Autosar support. So we have custom tailor-made and production-grade software that can be used by customers today with this processor and that will be expanded to cover other NXP products. The devices that are now in production today are the S32K3 4 megabyte parts and those are in three different flavors and um, on one of the previous slides where the family overview was shown it highlights the k344 that's the lockstep version the k324 family which is the dual core decoupled version and then the k31 core version all of those sampling today with development products as well and more information at the link shown there including resources available for our customers for development so thank you very much for your time, Amelia. Absolutely. And thank you for joining me, Danny. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from NXP. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, check out the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube youtube.com slash eejournal.